हेलो हेलो गुड आफ्टरनून एंड नमस्कार टू एवरीबॉडी एंड अ वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू द फ्रेंड्स हु आर ऑन द अदर साइड ऑफ द ग्लोब इट्स इमेंस प्लेजर फॉर मी एंड फॉर विश्वभारती परिवार टू वेलकम ईच वन ऑफ यू टू द इंटरनेशनल webinar on mahatma gandhi which is organized at the instance of ministry of education government of india this is actually in continuation of the national seminar webinar which we had organized in the early weeks week of the month and it is in continuation that we are having this international webinar today a very hearty welcome to all the three speakers and also to all the people who have joined us today i must thank professor gail presby for the immense help and untiring effort for organizing this seminar especially with the 48 hours notice and i'm also grateful to my friends who are helping us in organizing this friend uh, this uh, webinar and to professor bidu chakravarti who is going to give us the inaugural address at a such a short notice the three speakers we have on our program is dr sanjay lal from clayton state university professor gail presby from university of detroit mercy and bernie meyer peace activist known as american gandhi i think you will all agree with us that gandhian thought is extremely encouraging and sort of it can lead every person towards uh, uh, the value value laden life to the people once one is engrossed in the thoughts but it's never complete unless we really sort of adopt the gandhian way of life in our practice so we have a mixture of presentations today some theory and some activist and i'm sure all of you will enjoy the presentation uh let me invite professor bidu chakravarti our dear vice chancellor vishwabharti to please deliver his inaugural address professor bidu chakravarti please नमस्कार आदाब सत श्री अकाल एंड गुड मॉर्निंग टू माय फ्रेंड्स इन द अदर साइड ऑफ द ग्लोब एंड गुड आफ्टरनून फ्रेंड्स हियर इन शांति निकेतन एज वाइस चांसलर आई हैव टू डिस्चार्ज मेनी रोल्स एंड वन ऑफ देम हैपेंस टू बी इनग्रेशन ऑफ सेमिनार्स वेबिनार कॉन्फ्रेंसेस but today's topic is such in which i have got very very personal interest because i have been working on gandhi for quite some time and in my last stay in the us when i was teaching at virginia charlottesville i worked on gandhi ji and martin luther king the the, the book was published by oxford university press new york in 2013 with the title Mahatma Gandhi Martin Luther King Jr colon confluence of thought so i think i have got a natural kind of claim in so far as this particular webinar is concerned i am very happy and delighted to have in our midst three eminent gandhi specialist who not only worked on gandhi but also practiced gandhi in their day to day life i welcome professor gail professor gail uh, presby dr barney mayer and dr sanjay lal but you know i am not going to talk about anything about the webinar but i'll talk about my personal take on gandhi as an ideological perspective as a specific point of view as 
something which gave us direction in human life. You know, to me, Gandhiji was a not a superhuman being. He's just an ordinary human being like us, but with extraordinary qualities. If you see my slides, the slides which you'll find on the left of the screen, I just would like to focus on three points because the time is very short and I'd like to listen to all of you who took the trouble of being present despite being early in the morning in that part of the world. So I'll just spend about 10, 15 minutes on these three points and then I'll shut up. The first point is Gandhi's historical. There I would like to focus on Gandhi's role as a political activist. And while being a political activist, he developed certain modes of political action, which are relevant even in the context of 21st century. When you talk about Gandhi being historical, I'll start with a historical account. As you know, Gandhi was born in India, but his Karamhumi or his place of work where he became, where he transformed himself from Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi to the Mahatma Gandhi or to the political activist Gandhi in South Africa in particular. And then he came to India and then he, you know, experimented with his own ideas of how to combat the mightiest power in the, 20, in the 20th century. If you look at the history, you'll find that Gandhi combated the authority in South Africa on three occasions. With regard to first, he worked against the poll tax in South Africa. As you know, in case of the indentured laborers and the Indians there, the, the South African government raised the poll tax from three pounds to 25 pounds. That was very, that was very unjust as far as Gandhi was concerned and his colleagues who fought against the South African government. So they undertook a battle, a nonviolent battle against the government. And finally that tax was withdrawn and was reduced to pound three. So that was the first experiment of Gandhi in so far as nonviolent struggle is concerned. The second time when Gandhi really rose to fight against the South African government was against the Immigration Restriction Act of 1907. You know, there was a massive campaign when the Indians were not allowed to come to South Africa. And I am sure you know that story that when Gandhi was going to Durban, he had to stay a week on the shore of Durban port. Since he was not allowed by the government and his colleagues were not allowed by the government to land in Durban port. He fought and then he also succeeded in forcing the government to withdraw that particular unjust act in 1907. And just before that, in 1906, the South African government imposed Marriage Registration Act in 1906. And that was also unfair because even, even now it's compulsory, but at that point of time in India, marriage registration was not the rule of the game. I mean, we, we got, they got, people got married, you know, by inviting relatives. It was a more a social occasion, less a kind of occasion in which government intervened. So the South African government uh, declared that unless or until you show the registration certificate, will not recognize your spouse as your wife or will not recognize your marriage as official. And those who saw the film made by Richard Attenborough, you know, there was a statement by Gandhi that Gandhi was telling his wife that, you know, so far you are my concubine because your, the marriage between you and me is not recognized in South Africa. So, you know, the point I'm trying to make the Gandhi fought against all unjust 
rules and regulations. And in this act also, Gandhi succeeded. So you know, I'm, I'm referring to these three specific you know, designs, three specific campaigns in which Gandhi was involved, simply to show that here I see the, the beginning of the growth of the Mahatma in the context of South Africa. Then Gandhi came to India in 1914. And as you know, the first campaign in which he got involved was the campaign in Champaran in Bihar against the indigo planters. Then he got involved in the campaign against the, the industrialists in Ahmedabad textile mills. Then he got involved in uh, Kheda against the you know, the withdrawal of tax because Kheda in, in, in 1916-17 suffered terrible drought. So the, the peasants or the cultivators were not in a position to give the rent to the landlord. So Gandhi fought for them and Gandhi succeeded. And then, you know, there are three uh, major campaigns which Gandhi launched in India and he partly succeeded, partly failed the non-cooperation movement, which was also marched with the Khilafat campaign in 1920-22. Then in 1930-32, civil disobedience, which is also known as Salt Satyagraha. And then finally, the Kutinia movement. So, you know, if you want to see Gandhi being a historical figure, I think we normally look at these campaigns, which made Mah Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi uh, a new kind of, you know, um, figure in Indian nationalist movement in the context of the late 19th, early 20th century. Now, this part, I think, more or less, you know, well established in the historical literature. And more, historians more or less agree uh, that these different campaigns, you know, contributed to the rise of the Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi from Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi to Mahatma Gandhi. In fact, there is a famous statement by uh, John Smarts, you know, of uh, South African, the, uh, you know, the ruler, that you know, you gave us Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, the Indians, he talked about the Indians, Indians gave us Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, and we gave Mahatma to the Indians. So I mean, that's partly correct, because the Mahatma Gandhi's the style of, you know, opposition to political authority based on non-violence, that sort of experiment he conducted in South Africa. And you know, he, he conducted the same kind of experiment in India against the mightiest empire of the 20th century, namely the British Empire. So historical Gandhi is you know, more or less accepted. Now I'll come to the second point, transcendental Gandhi. Now here, you know, I, I'm, I'm making the point very clearly. I, I would like to make a conceptual point here that when you think of Gandhi, I think of two types of opposition. One type, which I call the act of omission. The second type of activity I call the act of commission. You know, if you look at Gandhian you know, style of opposition to political authority, you'll find that Gandhi insisted on withdrawal. You know, for instance, non-cooperation movement. If you look at the movements that he conducted in South Africa, they're all examples of act of omission. By that, I meant that Gandhi wanted his you know, colleagues who wanted his supporters, wanted his compatriots to withdraw you know, from the government so that the government is unable to function without the support of those who are contributing to the governmental functioning. So Gandhi, what is called practice, the act of omission. But in case of you know, civil disobedience, if you think of civil disobedience, when Gandhi violated the SALT law, in case of uh, the Quit India movement, when Gandhi said, Karenge ya marenge. It means that you know you you just go out and do whatever you want to embarrass the British, to just kick out the British. So here, I think Gandhi was in favor of committing an act. You know, it was a commission of act, the act of violence, the act of defiance, the act of you know showing the kind of you know anger against the um, authority. So I think you know this conceptual distinction I'll make when I am making the point number two. Now, transcendental, you know, by that I mean that, you know, Gandhi is relevant not only in India, but elsewhere. So this is one that Gandhi was not limited to a particular space. Gandhi was not a special figure. You know, he was not limited to India, one. And secondly, Gandhi, as you know, 
died in 1948 or he was killed in 1948 but even in the in the, in the 20, uh, 2020 in the you know um, uh, almost the, uh, the end of the first quarter of the 21st century we are still talking about gandhi whenever there is a non violent campaign all over the world we always try to justify with reference to gandhian mode of opposing the authority or opposing uh, injustice now here you know when i talk of uh, transcendentalism uh, though since i have got american friends and since i worked on uh, martin luther king junior i think i would like to draw your attention to that part now when i talk of this transcendental gandhi let me just you know uh, briefly talk about the the background in which uh, one of the you know topmost uh, civil right activists one of the topmost you know um, uh, uh, political activist who rose against the mighty american authority uh, happens to be martin luther king junior now martin luther king junior when you talk about martin luther king junior i think although you know we uh, the african americans got their voting rights in 1965 uh, after a kind of protracted struggle against um, racism but you know the, the campaign started uh, against um, racism in the form of opposition to jim crow law you know my american friends they know that that you know this particular jim crow law was relevant in the context of dixie states or the southern states and the jim crow as you know that it was a kind of you know um, a caricature of a of a black african american or at that point of time a negro that was the word used at that point of time the caricature of a uh, african american you know and uh, this particular caricature used to move around in the dixie states and it was essentially an attempt to show that the that the african americans were you know insane african americans were not stable mentally african americans were very uh, stupid the african americans were not intelligent enough to handle the situation etc etc you know primarily speaking the the jim crow shows were meant to um, put african americans in a very bad light so that show was going on and there are many oppositions going on and i find lot of you know historical evidence to show that jim crow law was opposed severely by by several, several african american leaders and i'll come to their um, their contribution very soon i think when you think of martin luther king junior i think i first i would like to refer to his father who was known as um uh, uh, daddy king or martin luther king uh, senior daddy king was a, as you know he was a pastor uh, in atlanta and this uh, daddy king you know he was also part of national association for the advancement of colored people naacp now this naacp was involved in lot of campaign against racism in the united states and probably you know that was the kind of you know that had tremendous impact on his son martin luther king junior who was also a pastor at that point of time now besides martin luther king junior i think i'd like to refer to some of the names i think my american friends will correct me if i am wrong because this work i did in in 2011 12 uh, if my memory serves me correctly i think these are the names which to me were very critical if we want to understand martin luther king junior's uh, political ideological stance vis-a-vis -vis racism now he, he, i would like to refer to first walter rauschen bush and again he was a kind of you know christian um, a devotee of christianity and he was probably uh, one of the persons who tried to combine liberalism you know the uh, philosophy of enlightenment with christian ethics and i i'm sure my american friends will agree with me that you know martin luther king junior or any of the african americans they never talked about test uh, the old testament they always talk about new testament presumably the old testament talks about slavery where the new testament is uh, an opposition to slavery so you know whenever martin luther king junior used to address in the in the chart he always referred to the stories from new testament especially with reference to the sermon on the mount so besides walter rauschen bus i find uh, there are three four names the for the other name is reinhold nibu reinhold nibu is also another you know a pacifist who was also involved in the struggle against racism in the united states and this uh, gentleman nibu uh, had a tremendous influence 
in Martin Luther King Jr.'s political ideological stance, and he talked about in his autobiography at length. Then I have another name is Howard Thurman. You know, I let me talk about Howard Thurman. I mean, Howard Thurman is probably one of those uh, members uh, who had contacted Gandhi again and again. And in the 30s, he came to India, he met Gandhi, and he wanted Gandhi to visit United States. And Gandhi's response was very interesting. He said that one, he said that, you know, the Americans, they are not really acquainted with the, the ideological ethos on which nonviolence will develop. So Americans may not appreciate uh, uh, the, the model or, or the ideological you know, perspective which I am trying to represent. One, and secondly, you know, Americans may not like me because of my you know, uh, attire, because I'm scantily dressed. And this particular uh, dress code, uh, according to Gandhi, doesn't go well with the Americans. So you know, Gandhi was supposed to go to America in the 1930s from London, but finally he decided not to go. And it was Howard Thurman who tried to persuade Gandhi to go to the United States, but somehow or the other didn't happen because Gandhi was determined or Gandhi was very, very strict in so far his own understanding uh, of the situation was concerned. So Howard Thurman. Then I have got another gentleman who also influenced Martin Luther King Jr. to a great extent is W.E.B. Du Bois. W.E.B. Du Bois, as you know, you know, one of the, 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 the first African-American who got into Harvard to do his PhD in the early part of the uh, 20th century. And Du Bois, you know, finally left America and went to Ghana, and I'm told that there he died. So Du Bois, the book, The Souls of Black Folk, that particular book was published in 1903. And I, I refer to, uh, and I, I see a lot of references to this particular book in, in Martin Luther Jr. King's, Martin Luther King Jr.'s, you know, uh, letters, Martin Luther King Jr.'s, you know, you know, the speeches, and also his autobiography. So, and then I think uh, the, the most important person, as far as our, my knowledge goes, happens to be Benjamin E. Mays. Benjamin Mays, you know, as you know, was the principal or the provost of, uh, sorry, president of Morehouse College, where Martin Luther King Jr. was registered for his PhD. And the story goes, which he mentioned in his autobiography, that you know, he, he attended one of his classes and he was so charmed by the ideas which Gandhi represented that he went out and bought the books which were available in the market and started reading you know, uh, Gandhi's text. And he said, you know, I realized that the power of love can be so effective and power of love can be so effective, so effective political weapon that was shown by Gandhi. So, you know, he appears to have been in love with Gandhian political ideas and thought. So to me, Benjamin Mays he was a very important figure in so far as Martin Luther King Jr. was concerned. So I know the point I'm trying to make that before Martin Luther King Jr. really undertook nonviolence as a method to contain uh, the racist American state, you know, he was baptized politically by the theory of nonviolence by many African American intellectuals, you know, starting from uh, Walter Rauschen Bush. You know, so it, it also shows that there is a continuity. There are a lot of people who talked about nonviolence. And, you know, let, let me also underline this point that these African American intellectuals who talked about nonviolence, they did not refer to Gandhi always. On the contrary, they referred to Christian ethics. Because and refer to Sermon on the Mount, which is also one of the important sources of influence uh, for Gandhi. So I think, in so far as nonviolence is concerned, Gandhi came later, especially you know in the in the uh, in the activities which Martin Luther King Jr. undertook. But most of the African American intellectuals, leaders who th thought of nonviolence, they drew the inspiration not from Gandhian ideals, not from any of the Indian philosophical traditions, but essentially from Christian ethics, essentially from New Testament, or to be very precise, essentially from the Sermon on the Mount. Now, then there is another interesting you know, parallel, which I think I must mention, and those who um, know about Martin Luther King Jr.'s you know, story, they probably know. You know, interestingly, that Martin Luther King Jr. thought of fighting racism you know, came out of a very practical experience, just like Gandhi. You know, as you know, Gandhi uh, uh, was traveling in a train in the first class, 
and then the the ticket conductor said that you are not allowed to travel in, in first class so he was thrown out in a station called Maritzburg and then Gandhi you know stayed there whole night it was a very chilly night and then Gandhi uh, wrote in his autobiography saying that you know after I was thrown out I was thinking what I should do should I go back to India or should I stay in South Africa and fight against these atrocities and Gandhi after having given serious thought to this question he decided to stay back in South Africa and started fighting against racism now the same kind of thing had happened with regard to Martin Luther King Jr. I mean those who know his you know life sketch they know that Martin Luther King Jr. when he was just 14 you know Gandhi had this experience at the age of 24 and Martin Luther King Jr. had the same experience when he was just 14 years old the story goes that he, he, he was in Georgia he went to a place to participate in an essay con, con, competition the title of the essay was the Negro and the Constitution and interestingly or happily that Martin Luther King Jr. stood first and he was awarded the first prize after the essay competition and he was coming back to Atlanta you know, the place to which he belonged uh, with his teacher Mrs. Bradley and you know he was sitting in the bus and all of a sudden some white passengers came into the bus and at that point of time the, there was a rule that the moment white passengers come in uh, the, the uh, African Americans will have to stand up and just you know give the uh, space to the white Americans so uh, then you know it was night it was uh, quite late at night and then the moment uh, these white passengers came uh, Mrs. Bradley you know she um, left her chair and she also asked Martin Luther King Jr. to just you know stay away from the chair she, Martin Luther King Jr. declined but in the, my Mrs. Bradley, you know, his teacher said that it is better to leave the place. Otherwise, there will be a lot of, you know, problem and probably will be thrown out of the bus. So, you know, he had to, he had to leave his seat and he stayed there. He said uh, 90 miles, you know, that's uh, he's uh, saying in this, you know, stating this in his autobiography, which was unfinished, uh, said that 90 miles distance, he stood in the aisle. And uh, though, you know, he, he was sitting in a particular um, seat, uh, which he occupied earlier than these white passengers. But given racism, which was in, uh, in force in the United States, the African Americans were not allowed to sit if the white passengers come in. So that's the experience. And then secondly, you know, after his uh, graduation from school, he went to Connecticut, you know, to earn some money to work in the tobacco farm. And, you know, he was uh, there, you know, racism or Jim Crow law was not active, but the Southern states of the United States you know, were, uh, were governed by the law of Jim Crow. So he said, you know, I was coming back from New York to the Atlanta. And the moment the train got into Virginia, which is again part of the Southern American or Dixie states, the, the conductor came and said that you cannot, you know, sit in the um, saloon. You, you have to go to somewhere else. And then, you know, the, he went to that particular place because to avoid, you know, uh, hitting or to avoid you know any kind of trouble uh, with the white passengers and then he said the the, the conductor you know uh, uh, put the curtain so that the white passengers don't see him and there he made a very interesting statement that you know to this this particular curtain was a curtain that had dropped on my selfhood so you know the point I have, i'm coming i'm i'm making the point that gandhi ji was there his source of inspiration because he realized every point of his life that if you fight the white Americans, if you fight racism by what is called weapon or by coercion, it is very difficult to contain racism by coercion. So Gandhiji's motto, the nonviolence, was something which is going to be effective in, in, in fighting, in fighting what is called Gandhi, uh, the, 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 the uh, racist regime. Now, then I'll talk about, you know, um, the, uh, the, the campaigns which uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, launched and also participated as one of the top leaders, which led to the promulgation of 1965 Voting Rights Act, uh, as a result of which the Americans got what is called adult suffrage. You know, there is a kind of mistaken in a kind of concept all over the world. In America is the kind of the, the most democratic country. But you know, as, as late as 1965, 
the one tenth, I mean, 10 percent, 12 percent of the American population, African Americans, didn't have voting rights. So America was hadn't had what I call adult suffrage. So the campaign, which is you know interesting, the first campaign, uh, which which really um, uh, hogs the limelight. Um, happens to be ah. a campaign in 1941 when Martin Luther King Jr. was nowhere in the scene. This particular campaign is called known as uh, the March to Washington, and that particular campaign took place in 1941 under the leadership of on one of the topmost uh, African American leader, A. Philip Randolph. A. Philip Randolph, you know, organized this campaign to Washington uh, in 1941. But it didn't succeed. But it's true. Uh, one thing that that was very clear that African Americans congregated and from all over the United States and went to Washington D.C. Especially, you know, before Abraham Lincoln Memorial, um, and then you know they launched, uh, they uh, expressed their resentment against the um, racist regime in the United States. Then the first important you know, um, uh, the model uh, campaign in which uh, Martin Luther King Jr. took place has, uh, happened in 1954. Now, this particular campaign has a history. You know, Rosa Parks, as you know, she's one of the top leaders. She's one of the first voice against racist American state. Rosa Parks was sitting in a bus. He, she was a kind of, you know, working in a tailor in a shop and she was going to office in the, in the morning and she sat in the bus and in that, in that, um, the, 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 there is an arrangement that the the, uh, the rear seats are meant for the African Americans, and the front seats are meant for the um, white Americans. And Sir Rosa Parks was sitting in one of the rear seats, and suddenly uh, a white American uh, came into the bus and asked Rosa Parks to just leave the seat. I would like to sit there, but Rosa Parks refused and opposed. But as well, there is the there is a fight, and the bus driver took the bus to the police station. And interest, and you will be, you know, shocked to know that instead of, you know, doing anything to the white passenger, Rosa Parks was arrested, and that was the starting point of the Montgomery bus strike in 1954. And the the buses stopped. Montgomery went for strike for so many days, and Martin Luther King Jr. came in and took the leadership. And then finally, it was uh, uh, agreed upon that these uh, the rear seats are meant for the uh, African Americans and they will not be disturbed even if a white passenger you know doesn't get a seat in the in the front rows so this is the 1954 montgomery bus strike which really put martin luther king junior in the world map as one of the kind of protagonists of nonviolent struggle in the context of the united states and then we have the very interesting uh, and the very you know widely known campaign known as uh, march to washington in 1963, which was again led by Martin Luther King along with uh, his colleagues. Now, that particular uh, campaign or that particular march is known because, you know, there Martin Luther King yeah. Jr. gave the famous speech, I have a dream. Now, this I have a dream speech is one of the, you know, topmost speeches which organized people to campaign against a ruthless uh, political authority despite adverse, you know, consequences. So this is one which also uh, was uh, organized by Martin Luther King Jr. non-violently. You know, there was no coercion, there was no violence, only the people from all over the world, you know, uh, congregated and um, uh, went to Washington, D.C. They congregated in from front of Abraham Lincoln Memorial, and then they campaigned that this particular regime is unjust. So they actually campaigned against racism in practice in, by the United States government. Then in 1963, there, he also uh, launched another campaign, so Birmingham campaign, that's also a march uh, to Birmingham against racism. And then finally, there was also a march between Selma and the Montgomery in 1965. So I think you know, if, if we look at the history of this uh, campaign, I have dealt with them in my book of 19, 2013, mm -hmm. uh, you'll find that in all the campaigns, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., along with his colleagues, you know, organized African Americans, and there are many white Americans too. You know, it's not only the campaign of the yeah. African Americans, there are many white Americans who participated in these campaigns because they felt that racism was anti-humanitarianism. So, you know, in order to support what is called universal humanism, um, there are many white Americans who participated 
in this particular kind of campaign. And but in, uh, we must not uh, forget that Martin Luther King Jr. was also the kind of you know the the figure in the forefront. But he has many supporters. You know, he has many you know young, able lieutenants who organized this campaign. And one of the gentlemen, I think we must you know nowadays he we don't you know, refer to his name pretty often. But I looked at archives and I found out there was a gentleman called Bayward Rustin. Now Bayward Rustin was the one who was in charge of organization and this uh, organizational preparedness of uh, whatever Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, undertook was done by this gentleman called Bayward Rustin. And I, I am you know, ready to defend that argument that without Bayward Rustin, probably Martin Luther King Jr. would not have become Martin Luther King Jr. Um, uh, as we know him today. So I think, you know, the point I'm trying to make that uh, Martin Luther King Jr. undertook many campaigns. Here he was inspired both by Gandhian ideals and also Christian ethics. I think we should not forget, I mean, we tend to romanticize Gandhi to a significant extent that it was Gandhiji, it was Mahatma Gandhi's political philosophy which inspired Martin Luther King Jr. I think that's partly correct. You know, I'll defend that argument and those who are interested can read my book. But at the same time, Christian ethics, you know, Sermon on the Mount was also an effective tool of organizing African-Americans because, you know, most of uh, African-Americans were Christian, very, you know, they were devout Christian. They used to attend churches and Martin Luther King Jr. and those who are in support of um, anti-racist campaign, they used to congregate and Martin Luther King Jr., if you look at, look at his speeches as a pastor, you'll find he used to defend nonviolence, not with reference to Gandhi in all these speeches, but with reference to Christian ethics or New Testament. So I think the point I'm to take that Gandhiji was certainly an important influence vis-a-vis -vis Martin Luther King Jr.'s campaign of nonviolent struggle. But at the same time, Christian ethics is also an important source of Martin Luther King Jr. inspiration. But you know, here I'm trying to make the argument a little complex by incorporating the importance of Christian ethics also in so far as the campaign which Martin Luther King Jr organized in the United States against racism. Now I'm coming to the last point. Gandhi is direction. Now, you know, if you look at all the campaigns which Gandhi launched in South Africa, if you look at the campaigns which Gandhi, you know, led in India, I think they are all directional. The directional means, you know, his first point is not to merely wrest political power. He's also concerned with, you know, containing the, the evil, the coercion, which we nurture every day in internal. So I think Gandhi's battle was twofold. Uh, on the surface, he was trying to combat the British rule, which is, which is you know, visible, which is very easy to understand. But you know, uh, below the surface, I find that Gandhiji was also trying to create a different kind of human being who will be compassionate enough to appreciate the concerns, to appreciate the pain, to appreciate the agony of his colleagues, either in the office or in the you know in the in the localities or in the country or globally. So I think you know, Gandhiji's uh, strategy, I find, is if you reduce it to merely political strategy, will be doing uh, you know really you know will not be doing a kind of fair understanding, fair treatment of Gandhiji's political philosophy, Gandhiji's directional you know uh, attitude. Because Gandhiji wanted to contain not only uh, political coercion um, at the behest of uh, British authority at that point of time, or for that matter, any authority, but at the same time, he was trying to create a new kind of human being which will be compassionate enough to appreciate others' agony, others' concerns. So I think, the friends, I'm coming to the end. I just I'll conclude that to come back to my conceptual you know, uh, div division between act of omission, act of commission. I think this is, to me, is most acceptable kind of, you know, methodological um, division uh, because these two ideas, act of omission, act of commission, will capture, you know, uh, very, very meaningfully, you know, very, very clearly the, the uh, political ideological mode of Gandhiji um, both in South Africa and later in India, and also the political ideological struggle which Martin Luther King uh, Jr. launched 
in the United States and succeeded along with his colleagues who also thought alike. As I said, Martin Luther King Jr.'s source of inspiration was both Gandhiji and also Christian ethics. And he was, he was uh, one who creatively blended both these influences and you know, organized the African-Americans for a long battle against the African, against the American racist state. Now, you know, if I stop here, the story will not be complete because, you know, I, I since I don't have time, I cannot elaborate that. You know, don't forget the civil rights movement was, you know, taking place at a point of time when America uh, was fighting a battle in Vietnam War. And I think this is also a very interesting, you know, part of the context which, you know, help the, this kind of campaign against the American state to succeed because Americans, you know, the, when the body bags were returning from Vietnam to the United States, the, uh, uh, the American authority was really at the receiving end. And at the same time, the civil rights campaign was going on. And I think, you know, I, I, you know the American friends, they probably are pretty uh, well aware of one of the basic films. You know, I mean, this, this, this film is one of the inspirational films to me, which led me to write this book on Martin Luther King Jr. is the film uh, entitled Mississippi Burning. And you know, Sidney Poitier was one of the actors, you know, one of the, my favorite actors. He performed in that particular um, film. And that was the, the film which really inspired me to a significant extent to write about the, the campaign which Martin Luther King Jr. engaged. So I think, you know, um, this is uh, all what I have to say. Just, you know, in these tiring days, uh, in these days of you know pandemic um, uh, uh, as a result of the outbreak of coronavirus attack please stay safe please be socially connected but at the same time maintaining physical distance you know best of luck god bless namaskar thank you so much professor chakravarti uh, i'm sure all of you will agree that professor chakravarti a great Gandhi scholar has set the floor for all of us for the rest of the presentations which we are going to have. His threefold dis uh, distinction, historical, transcendental, and directional, uh, actually covered all of uh, the rest of our presentations, which are going to uh, go in different directions. Uh, his uh, uh, history of the South India, uh, South African uh, uh, movements. Uh, which made Mah Mohandas uh, Karamchand Gandhi as Mahatma Gandhi uh, will be dealt by uh, Professor Grail Presby in her presentation and transcendental part will be dealt by, uh, by, by uh, Dr. Lal and the directional part will be taken care of by uh, Bernie uh, Meyer. So I think it's wonderful to have Professor Chakravarti and we are already little bit late uh, uh, in our schedule. So let me right away invite Professor Lal, uh, Sanjay Lal to make his presentation. Uh, Sanjay, Dr. Sanjay Lal, are you there? Uh, yes. Okay. I I'm here, can everyone hear me? Right, right, yeah, yeah, sure. So Dr. Sanjay Lal is a philosophy lecturer in Clayton State University, Georgia. He did his PhD in philosophy from University of Tennessee in 2006. And the title of his dissertation was The Tension and the Coherence of Love, Identification and Detachment in Gandhi's Thought. He studied at Georgia State University and Columbia State University. His areas of specialization are Gandhi, Peace Studies, and Non-Western Philosophy. His recent publications include books such as Gandhi's Thought and Liberal Democracy, uh, which is published by Rauman Rao and Littlefield in 2019. And his forthcoming book, Peaceful Approaches for a Move, Peaceful World, which is a more peaceful world, which is coming out from Brill Philosophy Peace Series in two, uh, 2021. And just to mention his, some of his recent articles, Revolutionary Non-Dualism, Simple Living, and the Eradication of Poverty in Gandhi's Philosophy of Nonviolence, Gandhi economics and the different, the uh, police movement solving our crisis of poverty, participation and character, affirming a vital connection, nonviolence and the disavowal of death as a harm. Gandhi's synthesis of liberal communicate, communitarian values, 
its basis and insights. Gandhi's synthesis of liberal and communitarian values, its uh, uh, basis and insight, as I already mentioned, uh, on widening the moral sphere in philosophy in contemporary world, uh, clarifying the place of love in Gandhian nonviolence, on remedial forgiveness, duty, and justice. Uh, today, he's going to speak on religion and public life, some Gandhian considerations. So let me invite Professor Lal to deliver his talk on religion and public life, some Gandhian considerations. Professor Lal, please. Uh, thank you so much for uh, that wonderful introduction. And thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, it, it, it's great uh, to be part of this conference. I'm glad that during these times we're able to have, have this kind of event. Uh, interestingly, uh, my, my comments, I think they, they go hand in hand with uh, the, the uh, points that were just made by Dr. Karbarki uh, concerning uh, how Christian ethics uh, had the initial, uh, initial um, role for the American Civil Rights Movement. Uh, I'll be sort of giving a distilled version of my uh, my thesis in Gandhi's thought and, and liberal democracy, uh, where, where basically I argue that uh, Gandhi calls for religion to have a, a very um, uh, significant, because a very overt place in uh, healthy democracy, a very uh, significant overt public place in healthy democracy. Uh, I'll give, uh, as I said, a, a distilled version of, of my, my thesis. Uh, for Gandhi, the liberal democratic project basically must consciously incorporate considerations of nonviolence, of course, uh, and that entails religious considerations. Uh, and, and this is necessary for the liberal project to be successful. Uh, the, the assumption that religious beliefs should remain confined to some supposed private sphere, given that such beliefs cannot be broadly and publicly justified, helps to distinct, distinctly categorize the modern age, uh, especially in Western societies. Both proponents and critics of religious inclusion in public life accept the notion that theological understanding should be capable of rational demonstration in a way that aligns with modern scientific conceptions and which will satisfy members of a pluralist society before religion can be granted a serious place in public activities. This insistence has in turn undermined the positive role religion can have in public life as a mechanism for enabling a more nonviolent society. I show that part of Gandhi's uniqueness as a political thinker lies in how he handles this issue. More specifically, it is both his conception of religion one that emphasizes nonviolence as an essential component, as well as the way in which he maintains religious beliefs can be taken as compatible with reason that enables him to go beyond the narrow considerations that are so typical of discussions regarding the place of religion in society. Ultimately, I aim to show that Gandhi provides insights and resources by which valuable social consensus can be reached on this traditionally divisive matter. Nicholas Walterstorff, a noted religious scholar who is also an advocate of greater religious inclusion in public life, inadvertently reveals problems with approaching the issue of religion's place in society uh, by use of a modern framework, uh, the very one he applies. In Religion and the University, Walterstorff makes a case for moving away from the perceived ideal of the secular public research university. Specifically, he denies that religious beliefs should be regarded as private and non-rational, and thus alien to the ethos of public scholarship. Notably, Walter Storff does not question such alleged dichotomies of fact and value and knowledge and emotion that underlie the view he denies. Instead, he argues that the practice of dialogical pluralism requires academics to be open to what religious beliefs can bring to scholarly endeavors, since he claims there are new and compelling arguments for the existence of God that are capable of persuading a diverse public and thus allowing for the kind of consensus and resolution of disagreements that many claim only the ways of science can offer. 
Notably in his arguments for giving religion a greater place in public life, Walter Storff concedes that only methods associated in the modern age with scientific practice can produce the levels of justification required for advancing policy in liberal society. Thus he agrees, however implicitly, that just those religious beliefs that are regarded as substantiated by such methods that should be deemed worthy of discussion in public life. Ultimately, by conceding these points, Walter Storff winds up walking in lockstep with those who call for a completely secular public sphere. Walter Storff's view, after all, aligns with the notion that it is only when religious insights can be shown to have the backing of modern methods of knowing can they be thought of as meriting inclusion in public life. This view clearly has implications regarding the social value of religion. Furthermore, Walter Storff is in seeming agreement with the common secularist view that only something like the practices of science as they are understood in the contemporary world can yield resolution and social harmony in the ways required by the liberal project. Gandhi was aware that such an understanding above all undermines the essential public role religion can have within any acceptable social order. I will now explicate this conclusion by turning to specific points found within Gandhi's writings. For Gandhi, religion's viability in public life is indisputable. This is in keeping with his overall askew of dichotomies, including ones that are presumed to exist between public and private life. In contrast to a modern paradigm, which sees inherent tensions between religious devotion and political involvement, Gandhi declares, I can say without the slightest hesitation that those who say religion has nothing to do with politics do not know what religion means. What's more is his proclamation that religion must either occupy the highways as well as the byways, the whole of life or advocate. Additionally, Gandhi states, my politics and all other activities of mine are derived from my religion. I go further and say that every activity of a man of religion must be derived from his religion. Elsewhere, the Mahatma asserts, for me there is no politics without religion, not the religion of the superstitious and blind, religion that fights and hates, but the universal religion of toleration. Politics without morality is a thing to be avoided. Gandhi's affirmation of religion in public life is underscored by, among other things, his call for including the uh, empathetic study of the world's sacred scriptures within India's educational curriculum, as well as his longstanding, longstanding practice of opening uh, the public meetings he led with prayers and religious devotionals. In regard to his integration of religion and politics, Gandhi sought, Joseph Prabhu argues, to achieve a dual transformation. On the one hand, he wished to purify politics by making moral and religious norms central to it. And on the other, he hoped to purify religion by saving it from the dangers of self-absorption and narcissism. Thus, we can better see why for the Mahatma, genuine religious practice and political involvement are actually inseparable from one another. For the purposes of my talk, it is notable that even though Gandhi affirms religions public place, he does not think the value of religious teachings uh, or the value that religious teachings can have for public life is contingent on whether a rational or scientific basis can be shown to underlie these teachings. Concerning his belief in God, he states, reason is powerless to know him. He is beyond the reach or grasp of reason. Of such a God, let the ignorant dispute the existence. Gandhi's remarks here accord with the fact that he downplays the matter of whether the Bhagavad Gita, perhaps the religious text that most inspired him, is an actual historical narrative between Krishna and Arjuna. Clearly for the Mahatma, religion has an essential place in public life, even though he does not see the value of religious teachings to be reducible to, or even all that related with whether external support, whatever external support, uh, these teachings can receive via modern methods of acquiring knowledge. The implications this point has for contemporary discussions, particularly among liberals, about religion's place in public life are well worth exploring. As Walter Storff's arguments underscore, 
it is taken for granted by liberals that only something like the practices of modern science can produce the harmony and resolution that liberal societies require for realizing both pluralism and the kind of policy justification that any reasonable individual should be expected to find compelling. Clearly to Gandhi, however, it is not necessary to show religious teachings have a quote, rational basis for these teachings to fulfill a valuable role in public life. On the contrary, it seems for him attempts to demonstrate such a basis ultimately undermine the positive role religion can have in society. At this point, it is worth noting that many of the Mahatma statements regarding religious matters seem to be in direct conflict with the sanguine mindset we see him exhibit above regarding faith and reason. For example, in responding to religious leaders who cited scriptural texts to justify untouchability, Gandhi point blankly states, I decline to be bound by any interpretation, however learned it may be, if it is repugnant to reason or moral sense. In keeping with this declaration, his arguments uh, to uh, these religious, he, <clears throat> he describes his arguments rather to uh, these religious leaders by stating, I appeal to their reason, I appeal to their humanity, I appeal to the Hinduism in them. Such statements indicate that Gandhi's views on religion are susceptible to a very real charge of inconsistency. More specifically, it seems as if he is unjustifiably selective on when he thinks we should demand rational support for religious claims. On one hand, he downplays the importance of whether we should seek a rational basis to establish the existence of God or the historicity of the Bhagavad Gita. On the other hand, he rejects scriptural interpretations that favor the practice of untouchability, at least partially because he finds them repugnant to reason. In resolving this apparent inconsistency in Gandhi's thought, we can gain much insight helpful for determining what religion's place in public life should be. As we will see, resolution of this inconsistency necessarily involves affirming the value of nonviolence. For Gandhi, it should be noted, religion provides us with the bare, I'm sorry, reason provides us with the bare minimum standard that our beliefs must pass, uh, but should not be taken as an absolute and final epistemic authority. Thus he states, every formula of religion has to submit to the asset of reason and universal justice if it is to ask for universal consent. Error can claim no exception, even if it can be supported by the world's religious scriptures. Elsewhere in the great corpus of Gandhi's works, we read, that which is beyond reason is surely unreasonable. Unreasonable belief is blind faith and is often superstitious. To ask anyone to believe without proof, what is capable of proof, would be unreasonable. As for instance, asking an intelligent person to believe without proof, the sum of angles of a triangle is equal to two right triangles. But for an experienced person to ask another to believe without being able to prove that there is God is humbly to confess his limitations and to ask another to accept in faith the statement of his experience. It is merely a question of that person's credibility. In ordinary matters of life, we accept in faith the word of persons on whom we choose to rely Though we, although we are often cheated. Why may we not then in matters of life and death accept the testimony of sages all the world over that there is God and that he is to be seen by following truth and nonviolence? True faith is appropriation of the reasoned experience of people whom we believe to have lived a life purified by prayer and penance. In categorizing the place Gandhi sees religion to have in forming the right beliefs, Bhikkhu Parak writes, every belief must pass the test of reason, but that did not mean it could not transcend it or go beyond it. Reason laid down the minimum, not the maximum, and specified what we may not, but not what we must believe. In a similar vein, Margaret Chatterjee states, Gandhi was by no means unaware of the tussle between reason and unexamined belief, but he often found that there were very good reasons for what simple people did by instinct. And in such cases, he acted as a mediator in the task of persuading others of the sound sense behind popular belief or practice. 
where a practice was found to be against reason and in defiance of man's moral sense, he had no hesitation in denouncing it. What's more is that Gandhi conceives of, conceives of truth in a way that is much broader and dynamic than prevailing modern notions of the concept. Thus for him, the limitations of reason must be acknowledged by those seeking a more complete grasp of truth. However, in contrast to the mindset that has been so common among members of religious communities, Gandhi emphasizes that it is only a partial and tentative grasp of truth that any of us can have in this life. Consequently, he is insistent that seekers of truth must remain humble about their understandings, as well as always be open to the insights offered by others. Chatterjee argues that for Gandhi, such an understanding of truth provides him with the metaphysical basis, both of his conception of ahimsa, nonviolence, and of democracy. More specifically, Chatterjee sees such an understanding to imply, quote, if all we have is a fragmentary view, we have no right to impose our fragment on others. These points have significant implications for questions pertaining to religion's role in public life. The rest of this chapter will seek to, or the rest of this talk rather, will seek to flesh out some of these implications more clearly. Uh, while Gandhi affirms reason as an essential tool that enables us to make determinations about what not to believe, for him, we should not overestimate its importance, particularly in regard to justifying social policy to a, a diverse public. Furthermore, though it is clear to him that religious teachings provide us access to truth, in ways that modern scientific practices cannot. He does not think these teachings are ever the final and complete word on truth. Indeed, for Gandhi, thinking such is ultimately a precursor to violence, since it perpetuates practices that involve imposing and even forcing one's understanding of truth onto those who do not share it. At the same time, Gandhi holds both that exposure to the varied understandings of truth by members of different communities can enhance one's own grasp of it, and that truth claims can be justified in ways acceptable to diverse individuals within a liberal society by means beyond those provided by modern scientific practices. It thus follows for Gandhi that as long as religion is publicly advanced in ways that are generally pluralistic, so no one system is privileged over others, and that different religious systems are shown to complement one another, as well as uh, nonviolent, so it's not presumed that any one system represents the complete truth that all should accept, then public advancement of religion is in the overall social interest. What's more is that for Gandhi, the core teachings of the great world religions can be interpreted in ways that preclude conflict and divisiveness. As Glenn Richard states, to Gandhi, religion is that which underlies all religions. It harmonizes them and gives them reality. It is that element in human nature, nature which seeks to realize the oneness of the soul and God and truth. This understanding is implied by Parukh, who identifies the characteristic of affirmation of living nonviolently with the outside world as essential to uh, religion for the Mahatma. Entailed by this categorization is the notion that activities of any religion uh, that is so properly called would necessarily exclude the coercive practices that liberal sphere must result from public state promotion of religion. Furthermore, Gandhi insists that living nonviolently with the outside world is a requirement for anyone who seeks to make genuine progress in more fully realizing truth. Public promotion of different religions in the way envisioned by Gandhi would provide the citizenry with explicit and varied models by which they can be inspired. Thus, this kind of promotion can enable greater social realization of what can plausibly be called our highest good. Given the necessity of religion to individual character development for many people at least, as well as the attempts of liberal societies to be pluralistic for Gandhi, public promotion of religion is not in and of itself antithetical to realizing a genuine liberal order. Indeed, for him, it would be a required part of such an order. Additionally, the significance for religious communities that Gandhi's affirmation of a broad 
all encompassing conception of truth has should not be lost on us. In keeping with the so-called scientific and modern paradigm, adherents of religion have insisted that the claims of their sacred texts be taken to be literal and historic truths. Thus they have conceded, however wittingly, to those who advocate for complete secularization of the public sphere, that only those truths that can be established by modern scientific practices should command our assent. In contemporary times, members of very religious communities seemingly agree that as long as the claims they endorse can be shown to conform to the supposed standards of modern society, then they have all that is both necessary and sufficient for their beliefs to be acceptable to the population at large. This point is indicated by Walter Storff's contention that because there are new and compelling arguments for the existence of God, academics should acknowledge a place for religion within serious scholarly activity. Ultimately, the implications of the Gandhian conclusion that the narrow and limited conception of truth that has dominated modern scientific discourse is inadequate for enabling genuine human progress, uh, these implications are too rich to ignore. For Gandhi, the truly significant truths that religious systems give us unique access to are not exclusionary and cannot be neatly captured by modern scientific methods. Thus he proclaims, I very much like this doctrine of the manyness of reality. It is this doctrine which has taught me to judge a Muslim from his standpoint and a Christian from his. Ultimately, a broad Gandhian conception of truth can allow for religious communities to move beyond the conflicts and antagonisms that have gone hand in hand with scriptural literalism, an approach that is clearly antithetical to affirmation of the manyness of reality. As Chatterjee argues, when we take our fragmentary grasp of truth to be comprehensive, we feel inclined to impose our understanding on others and thus commence and perpetuate cycles of violence. In discussing Gandhian philosophy, Douglas Allen nicely indicates how incorporating religion into the affairs of the state would better allow for social conditions through which citizens will be more conducive to realizing truths that religious systems can be seen to provide us with unique access to. Allen writes, Gandhi has a view of ultimate reality formulated in terms of satya or absolute truth. Such truth often formulated in terms similar to key passages in the Upanishads is experienced as a spiritual power or force that is infinite, unconditioned and beyond language in rational conceptualization. It manifests itself in terms of permanence, underlying change, unity, underlying diversity, and the most profound ethical and spiritual realization of the indivisible oneness and interconnectedness of all reality. Our educational approach must analyze how we are socialized and educated, really miseducated, in ways that prevent us from realizing the reality or truth of the unity of inter and interrelatedness of life. In the above passage, Allen succinctly reveals the strong connections Gandhi sees between the realization of truth, a traditional belief, I'm sorry, a traditional liberal value that the Mahatma thinks of in a way that is much broader than liberals are accustomed to, to a specific but non-inclusory religious insight and the active role of religion in bringing the two together, I'm sorry, the active role of government in bringing the two together. In further describing his understanding of truth, Gandhi states it is that indefinable something which we all feel but which we do not know. It should be emphasized that Gandhi does not think the experience of truth he refers to here is particular to those who identify with the specific religious tradition. Furthermore, he describes this experience as something, uh, his describing uh, the experience that way indicates that he thinks of the concept of reality he's referring to uh, above can be adequately justified to all members of a diverse community. It can be justified, in other words, in a manner that is consistent with the aims of liberalism. It is clear to him that adopting some of the formal language of specific religious traditions is also for a government ultimately indispensable for more widely illuminating to the public the true nature of reality. As Allen implies in the above passage, Gandhi maintains a people having consciously grasped this reality has profound social implications. Allen states further, 
Gandhi insists we cannot use violent means to achieve ethical and spiritual ends. In the means ends analysis, immoral violent means lead to immoral violent ends. However, Gandhi is also making a major ontological claim that goes beyond this ethical analysis. Nonviolence is a powerful bonding and unifying force that brings us together in caring, loving, cooperative relations that allow us to realize and act consistent with the interconnectedness and unity of all life. Violence, by way of contrast, maximizes ontological separateness and divisiveness and is based on the fundamental belief that the other is essentially different from me or us. In other words, in Gandhi's education, violence and hatred are not only unethical, but are inconsistent with the absolute truth of reality, whereas nonviolence and love are the ethical means for realizing the truth of reality. In his famous letter from a Birmingham jail, a work widely revered in the liberal tradition, Martin Luther King also gives rich and specific insight to the kinds of social implications entailed by the Gandhian conception of truth. When explaining the unjustness of segregation laws, King writes, all segregation statutes are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. I'm sorry, the segregated a false sense of inferiority. Segregation, to use the term of Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, substitutes an I-it relationship for an I-thou relationship and ends up relegating persons to the status of things. Hence, segregation is not only politically, economically, and sociologically unsound, it is morally wrong and sinful. Paul Tillich has said, that sin is separation. Is it not separation, an existential expression of man's tragic separation, his awful estrangement, his terrible sinfulness? It is significant that we can plausibly see here that the repudiation of separateness, which is seen as an obstacle to achieving genuine social equality, is key uh, to Hindu, Christian, as well as Jewish thought. This underscores Gandhi's earlier mentioned conclusions that at their core, all the great religious systems emphasize universal principles that do not clash with one another. And thus state promotion of religion need not necessarily entail divisiveness. Furthermore, the kind of relations Alan describes above most clearly exemplify the value of equality and the school of dominating oppressive systems that liberals are so well known for. Thus, promotion of nonviolence by the state can again be seen as necessary for advancement of the religious uh, project. In turn, it is plausible to think that incorporating religious insights is at the very least helpful to the objective of promoting nonviolence. Prabhu succinctly captures this line of thought while relating it to another central liberal concern. Prabhu states, it is a feature of some moral statements that they can be differently interpreted and justified and yet be shown to have validity at different levels of understanding. Thus the precept of honesty can be justified on the grounds of prudence, like honesty is the best policy, or of promoting trust and social harmony in society, utilitarian, safeguarding one's own integrity and righteousness before the law, Kant, as duty owed to others as autonomous moral agents, Kant and some versions of Christianity, and as a cosmic obligation, a, a dharmic justification, to mention only some possibilities. Likewise, people may agree on certain human rights, even though they ground those rights quite differently. In a sim similar vein, Gandhi wanted his teaching of nonviolence to have the widest possible adherence. Appealing to religious understanding was clearly an integral part of Gandhi's efforts to bring about a world in which nonviolence has the widest possible adherence. Consequently, it would follow to him that the state should incorporate such understandings in its attempt to create the kind of nonviolent society he worked and ultimately died for. To Gandhi, it is just such a society that can truly exemplify the great values espoused by liberalism. Thus he declared, the science of nonviolence can alone lead one to pure democracy. Here it is indeed worth noting that from a Gandhian standpoint, it is not incidental 
that so many of the great reform movements our world has seen, like the American Civil Rights Movement and Dorothy Day's Catholic Worker One, have been categorized by the devout adherence of their members to cherish religious principles. Uh, furthermore, as I argue in the book, to Gandhi, the development of a nonviolent society, the only kind he sees to be genuinely democratic, necessarily entails working to instill certain traits of character within the citizens. More specifically, it is when citizens are free from fear, detached in regard to worldly things, and selfless in their relations with others, uh, will they be truly capable of practicing nonviolence in socially significant ways? These kinds of citizens will be most able to askew life under those centralized economic and military systems that require violence to be maintained, that have so hampered realization of authentic democracy. Traditionally, religions have provided the most accessible means for developing the character traits that must underlie a nonviolent society. Nicholas Gere uh, provides an argument for thinking that what Gandhi recommends in regard to religion and public life is, despite liberal protests to the contrary, most in line with American social reality. Gear writes, the religious right keeps up its campaigns despite liberal protests, but their ideas are being tested in the liberal domain of public justification. The reason why Gandhi and King were not widely criticized for injecting religion into politics is because their message was always religiously and culturally inclusive. Fundamentalists usually divide and exclude, and we must trust ourselves and our democratic institutions to moderate such views or ban the worst as unconstitutional. As Gear applies, uh, implies above, there is no reason to suppose that government support and promotion of religion is antithetical to the liberal project, provided that the kind of religion that is supported and promoted by a government itself aligns with core liberal values, specifically inclusivity. Indeed, for Gandhi, this kind of religion is ultimately indispensable for advancing civic virtue and thus for better realizing a truly liberal society. Given that for so many of us, the great ethical truths, like those which underlie the affirmation of equality, inspire our deepest dissent when they are couched in the language of religion, Gandhi's conclusions here hardly seem outlandish. In the uh, final part of my talk, I'll quickly uh, consider some problems. Uh, I'd like to address an objection that certain readers of the book have raised uh, regarding my central thesis. Uh, I've argued and take Gandhi to hold, again, that it is acceptable and most likely necessary for the liberal state to openly promote and support only those religious groups that themselves observe and adhere to values commonly associated with liberalism. Uh, many have expressed qualms with this notion, which is predicated on the viability of publicly affirming a difference between reasonable and unreasonable religion. It has been argued that the Gandhian kind of religion that I advocate, state support for, ignores serious nuances and difficulties that followers of more exclusivist religions present. Additionally, some have suggested that it is not appropriate for the state to affirm a distinction between reasonable and unreasonable religion as doing so ultimately perpetuates a form of state violence and is thus contrary to the spirit of Gandhian philosophy. In response to these kinds of objections, we should first remember that for Gandhi, approaches are unreasonable insofar as they either encourage or give rise to violence. Furthermore, he continually insisted that genuine progress toward truth can only come from nonviolence. Thus, I do not think that ruling out certain approaches deemed unreasonable conflicts with the Gandhian emphasis on seeking to more fully realize truth, a goal liberalism has historically shared. What's more on the reading of Gandhi I put forward, approaches deemed unreasonable will not necessarily be excluded from society in the sense of being legally prohibited. I take Gandhi after all to hold that nonviolent practice entails a basis for granting core freedoms, even to those religious groups whose mes messages are ultimately antithetical to the liberal project and that in a more ideal society, individual freedoms would be honored, even if doing so brings about suffering to others. It's my contention, however, that by actively promoting religious approaches deemed reasonable, the state can play a significant role in fostering nonviolent qualities among the citizenry, 
and that, can, and that by doing so, individuals in the state will be better able to suffer at the highest levels for their convictions. In other words, they'll be better able to perform acts of satyagraha. In such a scenario, it would seem that even those who take unreasonable religious approaches would be better able to pursue truth as it appears to them and to see truth that as it will be revealed in greater acts of satyagraha. Thus, I do not see the kind of problems discussed by the critics to result from a public affirmation of the reasonable unreasonable distinction regarding religious approaches. Ultimately, I maintain that while many religious paths and practices can be permitted in the more ideal Gandhian liberal state, only those religions that can best coexist with the demands of public reason and plurality should be given state affirmation. Indeed, I take this to be necessary for the state to better realize core liberal values. Uh, in my uh, conclusion, I'll state that not without serious justification, the modern mind has taken religious systems to be inherently incompatible with the values that should be embodied by the right kind of social order. The uniqueness of Gandhi's political thought can be seen by his willingness to see beyond the external trappings of religion and notice the presence of an essential core that is both conducive to and necessary for realizing the social ideals that even the greatest proponents of modernism should be leery of abandoning. Gandhi was able to look beyond appearances and see that genuine religion is a true ally in public efforts that aim to build a more ideal society. Thus, his approach in dealing with religion's role in public life is worthy of thoughtful consideration by us in the present day. Thank you. Hello. Hello, am I audible? Okay. Oh. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor uh, Sanjay Lal, for your nice and very illustrious speech. And uh, let me now request our learned audience, if, if you have any question, please put forward your questions in the chat box rightly, so that I can pick up questions uh, for this clarification from our honorable speaker. So may I request the participants to post your questions over the, the, the uh, speech on uh, delivered by Dr. Sanjay Lal. If you have any question, please put forward in the chat box. And by this time, whatever I found that uh, the speech is very informative, enlightening, illustrious. Uh, many audience has been uh, appreciated uh, the speech delivered by Dr. Sanjay Lal, excellent also. Th thank you. Uh, I, I really appreciate uh, the, the comments and thank you for listening to me, everyone. Right, right. So, uh, I don't think there is uh, much questions, even if it is. Uh, I think that Dr. Lal will be in the floor. And if any questions come, yeah, one question, Dr. Lal, for you one question, do you believe the nonviolence is the outcome of religious beliefs? Dr. Sanjay Lal, please, you, one uh, question for you. Yes. Uh, yeah. Please. I, I would say that it is, uh, one outcome of the right kind of religious beliefs. Uh, uh, I, I, I am hesitant to say that uh, religious beliefs are necessary uh, for, for uh, uh, the development of nonviolence, but uh, for, for many people, it, it does seem like religious beliefs are necessary. But uh, I, I think, again, it, it depends on whether it's uh, the genuine kind of religion, the true religion. And uh, when, when that type of religion is promoted, the, the kind that uh, uh, Martin Luther King is referring to in his letter, the Germ uh, Birmingham Jail, uh, th then I, I, do, I do believe that ultimately uh, nonviolence would be, uh, would be the outcome. Uh, there might be other ways uh, for, for people to realize nonviolence, but uh, I, think, I think it is one uh, very real uh, way to realize that outcome. 
Okay. So one more question uh, from Professor Asha Mukherjee. Uh, for Gandhi, religion provides bare minimum, but what is the final authority? Uh, thank you. That, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think for, for Gandhi, uh, the final authority always has to just be one's own direct experience. And uh, ultimately, uh, one's experience underlies uh, one's uh, uh, conscience in terms of how they should or shouldn't be. Uh, so uh, I think beyond that, uh, we, we can't really we can't really say much more. But again, uh, re reason is useful. It just it just cannot be uh, the final authority here. Okay. So uh, at this point, there is no such question. So thank you, Dr. Lal, for your illustrious presentation and. Uh, enough clarification over to questions and i think you will be on the floor and if any questions come for you after uh, professor uh, gail presby's lecture definitely we will bring forward for you thank you sir then may i now request thank you, thank you. yeah yeah then may i now request our professor asa mukherjee madam to introduce our next speaker professor gail presby university of detroit Mercy. ma'am please a very hearty welcome gail uh, Professor Gail Presby, an uh, uh, old friend of mine. Uh, we extend a very hearty welcome to you, Gail, from Vishu Bharati, Shanti Niketan. Uh, professor Gail Presby is a professor of philosophy at University of Detroit, Mercy, and she was also chair during 2009 and 12. She's the director of James Carney Latin American Solidarity Archives since 2002. She also taught at University of Nairobi, Kenya as Fulbright Senior Scholar during 1998 to 2000. In 2005, she had a research Fulbright grant hosted by World Peace Center at MIT. Uh, she also spent some time in Pune, India, where she studied Gandhian nonviolence. She holds an MA and PhD from Fordham University. Gail's areas of specialization are social and political philosophy, philosophy in Africa, philosophy of peace and nonviolence. She teaches peace and social justice, ethics, African philosophy and culture, and other courses related to social and political philosophy. Her interests are in cross-cultural and feminist explorations in philosophy and the philosophy of nonviolence. She had edited several books and research articles, just to mention some of them. The Philosophical Quest, a cross-cultural reader, 1995, and then also republished in 2000. Thought and practice in African philosophy in 2002. Philosophical perspectives on war, on to, uh, terrorism, 2007. And just to mention some more research articles, uh, Gandhi, uh, Abdurrahman, uh, collaborations to end injustices in South Africa, Gandhi's many influences and collaborators about which Professor Chakravarti talked in the morning, uh, uh, earlier uh, in this webinar, uh, globalization and the crisis in Detroit. We are all familiar with the crisis in Detroit, which took some time back. Um, evaluating the legacy of nonviolence in South Africa, Gandhi, the grandfather of conflict transformation, should women love wisdom. Today, she will speak on how Gandhi drew inspirations and learned nonviolent resistance techniques from women. Professor Chakravarti talked about South African influence, and actually, Gail is going to go in details the South African, uh, uh, the, the kind of sacrifices which women uh, made during Gandhi's uh, uh, stay in Africa uh, during 90, early 90s and how he actually became Mahatma Gandhi, about which Professor Chakravarti has extensively talked uh, in his uh, inaugural address. So I would invite once again to Professor Presby, and we would like to listen to her. Thank you. Gil, floor is yours. 
Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much to Professor Mukherjee for inviting me. Thank you to Vice Chancellor Vidyat Chakrabarti for sharing your comments and your book is wonderful. I'm very glad to be here on a panel with you. I'm going to try to share my screen now. Hopefully it's going to work. Let's see. Can you see my slideshow? I hope. Yes. Yes, okay. yes. 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 It is visible. It is visible. Great. And I also want to take this moment to say happy retirement, Professor Mukherjee, because I asked her, why do we all have the pleasure of gathering together to discuss Gandhi on this day? August 30, and she said, I'm retiring tomorrow. So please, <laughs> happy you retirement. So much, yeah, yeah, thank you. And uh, Professor Mukherjee is someone I've met at the World Congress of Philosophy several times. You can see us in Delphi. This is where the Oracle spoke about Socrates. And she also was able to come to my university and give three helpful lectures to our students. So I'm very glad to have this opportunity to return uh, this uh, this. Uh, opportunity now to speak to all of you. So thank you so much for joining. Thank you very much. Who am I? Oh, oh you're welcome. Uh, I've been to South Africa many times. Well, 10 times. I've been to India four times. Your country is too large. I don't know everything about it, but when I have gone, it is always to study and learn something about Gandhi and Gandhian nonviolence. So I hope I can share uh, something with you. I really struggle to say, what will I tell an audience that is already quite familiar with the basics of the story of Gandhi's nonviolence? So I thought what I would share is um, something you may not know so much about because I don't see it that often reflected of front center in the literature on Gandhi. And that is that there is a whole story about uh, South African women resisting the pass laws. And this story is actually intertwined with the Gandhian story because much of it happens in 1912 and 1913 in the early years when Gandhi is putting together his uh, methods of nonviolent action. There are several uh, historians, Julia Wealth, Cheryl Walker, who have gone into detail about South African women's uh, nonviolent protests of the past laws. But the Gandhi scholars don't know that much about it. But I do have to say that uh, sometimes in huge 600 page uh, summaries of Gandhi's life, there's no mention of it. However, uh, Ramchandra Guha's book focuses only on the South Africa years. And in that book, he has one sentence mentioning these women of Bloemfontein. And so I don't want to say it's been completely ignored, but it has been mostly ignored. But what does Guha say here? Right? He's saying, why did Gandhi agree to let his wife court imprisonment? It may have been a result of his encounters with suffragettes in England. So I'm going to develop that, the role of the British suffragettes and Tamil women in Transvaal. We'll talk about that. There was also the example of African women in the Orange Free State who had recently turned in their passes to the authorities, pledging never to carry them again. He mentions this. He has a footnote to one article in 
Indian Opinion, Gandhi's newspaper, but I am going to develop this story that was given one sentence in Guha's book. Here's two contemporary South African historians. Nambosina Gasa, she has written much about the laundresses in Bloemfontein and the women in Bloemfontein who had this struggle. Kalpana Hiralal has written much about the Indian women in Gandhi's two communities, Phoenix Farm and Tolstoy Farm, and their struggles and their contributions. But neither of them mention each other. So I think these stories need to be told together, drawing on the work of these historians. So you may know, and it's already been mentioned, Gandhi came to South Africa in 1893. He set himself up as an attorney. By the way, in this famous uh, picture, you see Sonia Schlesen on the right. Now, she's been mentioned by some scholars like Brown, who wrote uh, a biography of Gandhi. But in some books, these and other photos of her are shown without any captions even mentioning her name. So you're going to learn a little bit about her because she was very important to Gandhi. Okay, so Gandhi was establishing the Natal Indian Congress in 1894, advocating for Indian interests. What was going on during this time? I know I have to be very quick, but let me just mention that during this time, Gandhi was there. There were the wars between the British and the Boers over who would control this vast area of South Africa. Now these uh, colonial powers had already subjugated and already harmed and killed many of the people indigenous to South Africa, whether it was the Khoisan or whether it was the Zulus even using a uh, Gatling gun and uh, automatic weapons. But now they were fighting amongst each other. And because the Boers uh, could not, uh, did not have the same, uh, army, size of army, etc., and the same weapons, they used guerrilla warfare. And because of that, the British put women and children in concentration camps. So uh, not one of the first, uh, Cuba was before this a few years with concentration camps, but the British did have these early concentration camps. And the reason I mention it is because there was a British woman who uh, was a suffragette and who was concerned when she heard about these camps. Concerned enough that she decided to travel down to South Africa and she visited 34 of these concentration camps and she wrote a report back to England saying that there were uh, terrible deaths in these camps. Uh, the camps were running for 18 months at that time. They had 26,000 deaths, 24,000 were children under 16 and infants. She wrote back to British liberal leader, Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman, and said, you have to stop this. So this is some of the activism going on. And the British government sent down Millicent Fawcett in 1901 as the head of a British government commission looking into these camps. And Fawcett had been a suffragist since age 19 in 1866, she had been working for women's suffrage in Britain. And in 1897, she led 
the National Union of Women's Suffered Societies, and she advocated the use of nonviolent tactics in order for women to win the vote. So this is her background. She's the one chosen to go down to South Africa in 1901. And I want to mention she is now has a statue uh, devoted to her in Parliament Square for her suffrage work. She was the one who did an expose and stopped the practice of these concentration camps. But there are other historians who've talked about it wasn't only the Boers who died in these concentration camps. And so uh, Nkuna explains also that Black South Africans were cleared from the land to prevent the Boers from attaining a assistance. And so by the end of the war, 17,000 Black South Africans had also died in these camps. And that these fatalities are rarely mentioned in the literature. So as we look back on our history, we have to make sure that we draw on the works of Nosifo Nkuna and others who've talked about the deaths of Black South Africans as well. Now, this is some of the background about why the British suffragettes were popular and well known in South Africa. So when in 1906 they had another round of protests in Britain, Gandhi, who just then had started his, uh, oh, actually even before he started his Indian opinion, you can see um, he is writing about them because before he started Indian opinion, Gandhi wrote 500 letters to the editor of other newspapers. And then he decided to start his own newspaper. You can read about this in his, uh, Hofmeyer's Gandhi's uh, Printing Press, a recent book. But this is one of the first things Gandhi says in print about the suffragettes. He says, to a man setting out on an adventure, other people's advice is of no use. English suffragettes were politely advised by Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman, the Prime Minister of England, to give up the method of seeking imprisonment that prudent counsel was rejected by those brave women. How should Sir Henry know how much they suffer from being without a franchise? So he's writing about the suffragettes, honing in on their practice of courting arrest and filling the jails. And then in Indian opinion, in December 1906, he talks about Miss Milne, a suffragette, who was making a speech in front of the Houses of Parliament. The police attempted to stop her, but she persisted. She was then arrested and prosecuted. She had to pay a fine or be imprisoned. The brave lady preferred to go to jail. And so then he adds, hence I would appeal to all and say, just as Miss Milne preferred going to jail, so must every Transvaal Indian. So he's using this British woman, Miss Milne, as a role model for the men in his own community. But I say the men because at this point, he is not asking the women in his community to go to jail. He is thinking his women should not go to jail. This is something the men should do. Again in 1907, he, uh, Gandhi says, we should show the same determination and sacrifice as the suffragettes in England, okay? And look at the kind of uh, front page news the women were making in England. This, I want to say, is making an impression on Gandhi. Nevertheless, it will still be another five years before he invites women of his own community to engage in these actions. 
Now I want to mention Sonia Schlesen. She was his um, secretary, but really she was a right, right hand person helping him in many ways. And she also took public stands. She also wanted to address public rallies, but uh, sometimes uh, she was not able, but Gandhi would read her um, speeches. Now, it's interesting because she was very much uh, uh, allied with the suffragette movement. And as you can see, she wore her hair very short and cropped. And in uh, one uh, place, uh, Chandigarh Gandhi, who was uh, living at uh, Phoenix Farm, said uh, Schlesen, she had bobbed hair. And when someone asked her why her hair was so short, she replied, why waste time in fixing it? Should only males be free from that? Should all rights be reserved for men? So Schlesen was not just a secretary who took notes. And in fact, in a book by George Paxton about her, he talks about how Schlesen would travel third class on the railways and a railroad porter would say, you must move to the carriage assigned to whites and she would refuse and say, why don't you arrest me or charge me? She was not arrested, but she dared to do something uh, like that, refusing to move to the white carriage because she wanted to be in solidarity with the other women in her movement. She also wanted to study law and Gandhi wanted to take her as his apprentice, but the justice of the high court refused women uh, could not study law and women would not be allowed to be judges in South Africa until 1923. Now, you may also know Abdullah Abdu Rahman. He became a very close friend of Gandhi's. Gandhi mentions him in Satyagraha's in South Africa on page 12. He says, that he was a Dutch brought, uh, he was uh, the children of Dutch brought Muslim slaves from Malaysia and descendants of mixed Dutch and Malay heritage in the old South Africa system. That meant he was considered colored. And in the old colonial legislature of Cape Town, he could hold political office and he did. But these laws were then jeopardized when uh, when there was uh, the movement to make the Union of South Africa independent from Britain. Now, Gandhi says he got to know Dr. Abdul Rahman because they traveled together for four weeks on this uh, 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 steamship on their way to England, where they landed to influence the outcome of the draft constitution. He was one, uh, Abdurrahman was one of several delegates who came there. Gandhi and Abdurrahman were both in the House of Lords Strangers Gallery, listening to Parliament debate on whether the new South African Union would be restricted to rule to white. And uh, after the failure to alter the act, Gandhi recommended to Abdul Rahman, let's take up passive resistance. And he promised to send him a copy of Thoreau's essay on civil disobedience. A few weeks later, Abdul Rahman suggested in his newspaper that the colored community adopt the Indian strategy of passive resistance. And Abdul Rahman wrote many stories about Gandhi and many stories about passive resistance in his newspaper, APO, that was connected to his political movement, African Political Organization. And it is in this way 
that many people in Bloemfontein got to read about Gandhi's movement. And then Abdul Rahman invited Gandhi to write an article in the APO. And so Gandhi, as guest author, described the whole method and the whole idea of civil disobedience and the role of suffering in civil disobedience. So I want to say that this is how his idea spread within South Africa to colored and black South African communities. Now, we've got to mention uh, another important person, Charlotte Makiaki. She was born in South Africa. Uh, she uh, toured England with a Jubilee choir and toured US with the choir. She was offered a scholarship at Wilberforce University. She studied with W.B. Du Bois, got a bachelor's degree and returned to South Africa with her husband, who was an AME minister, and they founded Wilberforce Institute. Now, it's going to be the 150th anniversary of her birth next year, so already South Africans are preparing a celebration they are going to have next year for her. She helped organize the Bloemfontein women to gather 5,000 signatures on a petition and they sent a delegation of six women, including uh, Makiaki herself and Katie Lou. Katie Lou, who will later be involved in many of the other women's marches in South Africa. They traveled in April 1912 to Cape Town with Cape Parliament member Walter Rubusana and Senator Schreiner and said in a petition they wanted the, the path laws that were just now being enforced in Bloemfontein, they wanted those path laws nullified, taken away. Now, it's interesting in a recent book here that uh, Betty Govindan and Kapana Hirlal have put together, there is a chapter that has Ella Gandhi in it. And she's the granddaughter. She's the granddaughter of Gandhi. And uh, she says in her chapter, she mentions these women of Bloemfontein in two paragraphs of her chapter. So there is sometimes this slight message, but I'm trying to fill in the details of this movement inspired by Gandhi. And she notes, this mounting opposition to the past law spread led to the protest by women in the province of Orange Free State. In spectacular nonviolent demonstrations, women from many towns in the province marched to the local government offices and handed in their passes. And Ella Gandhi continues, the fact that Indian opinion under Gandhi at the time published these events shows the tacit solidarity that existed among groups working in different spheres of interest and influence, but all facing a common enemy of oppression. And so in the APO, this is, sorry for the blurry, I was reading, uh, you know, that microfilm, but as early as 1912, we have Abdul Rahman saying in his newspaper, if any relief is to come for, from the local bodies of the Orange Tree State, then the native and colored women may as well abandon all hope unless they absolutely refuse to carry passes under any circumstance that is adopt passive resistance. That seems to us the only solution of our difficulties. And they did it. But as they were doing it, interestingly enough, Gandhi was publishing an article about Emmeline Pankhurst, a British suffragist who had just gotten arrested in April of 1913. An Indian opinion covered an in-depth story about her, not agreeing about everything she said, 
but it did say about her courage there is no doubt whatsoever if however we leave aside her mode of fighting which uh, gandhi thought wasn't 100 percent nonviolent, like he wanted and only think of the suffering she has borne we shall find much to learn from her and then he goes on to say Though a woman, Mrs. Pankhurst, is as manly as any man, Indians should emulate all this courage. It's interesting that he's still using words like, like the, the men are those who show courage, but he's having to admit these women are also showing courage in their arrests and during their detentions in prison. Okay. Now, what is going on? I'm trying to give you an overview. So I told you, uh, you can see on the left, Abdul Rahman says, women of Bloemfontein should court arrest. Okay. In the meantime, in the pages of Indian opinion, we see that Gandhi is consulting women in his movement. And the headline on May 10th is that Indian women in his movement are preparing to court arrest. Okay, but before the Indian women in his movement do court arrest, 80 women in Bloemfontein are arrested during protests. And then in September and October, the women in India court arrest. I want to say they are encouraging each other. And Gandhi is learning from the Bloemfontein examples, which have happened just prior to his own experiment involving women in his movement. What's going on in Bloemfontein? You have a, a washerwomen who are making their living uh, in it's a segregated society but they are washing the women of clothes of white women of Bloemfontein and because of concerns for cholera they have to use a, a registered laundry in the middle of town which they had been doing, but now suddenly they were being asked to show their passes anytime they would come near that laundry. And so their whole livelihood was in jeopardy. Because of this, not only the laundresses, but other shopkeepers and members of the colored community of Bloemfontein joined with these laundress women in a large movement saying, we refuse to carry passes. And here's an example, here's a photograph of the women protesting at the Bloemfontein Town Hall in 1913. 600 women agreed to court arrest with civil disobedience. They cornered the mayor, 80 of them were arrested, they refused to pay a fine and they were jailed. On June 2nd, Ruth Palulu, uh, the women of, of Finburg also declared they will not carry their passes. So Finburg is another location just outside of Bloemfontein. The Finburg police arrest six black women at a time because that's the capacity of their jail and they hold each for two weeks. Now among those who they're holding is Ruth Palulu, she was arrested in front of her students on August 15th, and so the school closed down during her imprisonment. Ruth Palulu was 23 years old and the daughter of a Methodist minister. A local newspaper writing on the case noted, our local suffragettes may be seen about the town wearing a blue rosette, which is assumed to mean they the wearers are not going to take out passes. So this is how popular the suffragettes are. Now, the whole time this is happening, Indian Opinion is writing articles about these women. So we know that Gandhi and his movement was watching closely. Here are others from August 1913, talking about the women of Vinberg that I've just told you, Ruth Palulu was one of them. So Gandhi and his movement are watching. Here's one thing uh, the article I just showed you said, 
One wondered how these women kept their tempers and remained orderly throughout, more especially when one remembered those wild and violent scenes of big political demonstrations by women of England. Okay, there was no doubt at Vinberg as to which demonstration was more ladylike in conduct and manner. So I can say a lot about these things. Oh, we have our nonviolent protesters. They're brave as men, but ladylike at the same time, they have a lot to live up to. But these are the comments being made. Other newspapers in South Africa are covering the suffering of the women in jail and how the women are so determined. They eat bad food. They know they are fighting the battle. Uh, they are not relaxing. They are fighting for freedom. Okay. And these are some of the continuing uh, uh, coverage in the local newspapers. On top of it, we have a petition to Viscount Gladstone uh, back in India. Say, oh, sorry, uh, Gladstone, Lord Gladstone, saying we want. Uh, he's the Gladstone's Governor General of South Africa, and they want him to do something about these past laws, and that struggle will continue. Uh, but now, and at this point, I realize I'm almost out of time, so I don't think I'm going to be able to do part two. But you already know some of this background. Uh, Vice Chancellor Chakrabarty already told you about how there were these laws against non-Christian marriages and how there was a concern about national honor of uh, the Indian women if their marriages were considered invalid. You know about that already. And it was in this context that Gandhi talked to his wife, Kasturba, and other women at Phoenix Farm and Tamil women at Tolstoy Farm and got their permission. And he really grilled Kasturba. Are you sure you can if you decide to do this, you can't just give up. It's going to be tough and you could be in jail. And she actually had a very difficult time in jail, but she did it. She engaged in civil disobedience. She landed in jail. She suffered in jail. She was put into hard labor in jail, uh, but she did it. And uh, because Kasturva insisted, what defect is there in me which disqualifies me for jail? Gandhi talked about this. So she insisted she had to do it instead. I mean, in, in spite of the earlier prohibitions. Now, let me just have a time check. Should I jump straight to my conclusion? Dr. Mukherjee, uh, please let me know how much time I have because I realize I'm going over time so I can try to shorten it. Should I wind up now? Uh, you can take another five to seven minutes. Perhaps. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Five to seven minutes. And this is an exciting story, but I, and I, if I had more time, I would give it the same detail, but I'm hoping you already know more about this story. Gandhi wrote about the Indian women passive resistors in his newspaper in May, just before the women of Bloemfontein did their actions. Uh, the, this is a description of their actions, how they got arrested and how they were involved in public speaking, uh, giving speeches to the miners, asking the miners, many of whom were indentured Indians, some of them being re-indentured because they could not afford this three pound tax. The women gave public speeches that encouraged thousands of men to strike against this three pound tax. And then they were finally arrested. While they were in prison, Baliyama Munaswamy 
died. She could have been released on medical conditions, but she said no. She did not want to be released until their cause was won. It wasn't until uh, Gandhi was successful in agreeing uh, with a smut that she was released, she died within 11 days. But Gandhi also, the whole time, his heart was broken, but he was so, uh, you know, any idea he had that women could not do civil disobedience was changed when he saw Valiyama's sacrifice. And then he was also very shrewdly noting the women's imprisonment worked like a charm upon the laborers of the mines near Newcastle. He noticed that the women taking on the sacrifice motivated the men and made his movement grow. Now, Kastorba had become so ill for several days after her release from jail, Gandhi was worried she would die. She had to be nursed back to health. And Millie Pollock, a very close friend of Gandhi's, made a speech. This was essentially a woman's movement. If it had not been for the women taking lead, there would have been no strike. So they really have to be given that credit. It was a large movement. Women participated in the entire thing. And uh, one thing I mentioned, but I won't go on with the slides. Oh, one last slide. Because he, uh, Gandhi also got other women to do his work using their influence, like Olive Schreiner and Betty Molteno. So I'll just end with this Emily Hobhouse, who you remember from the beginning wrote to General Smuts, Minister of the Interior, about this movement, saying, the Indian's grievance is really moral, not material. And so, having all the spirit, power of the spiritual behind him, he, Gandhi, and you are like Mrs. Pankhurst, remember the suffragette woman. And never, never will governmental physical force prevail against the great moral and spiritual upheaval. So even these women had a very important role in the success of Gandhi's 1913 campaign, and they taught him lessons that he kept throughout his life. So thank you so much for this opportunity to share. Great. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Presby. Um, OK, so maybe we can take some questions from the audience. Uh, we have a question, Gail. Both Gandhi and his uh, hagiographers claimed, biographers, uh, claimed the viewed, uh, uh, claim he viewed women as equal to men, pointing to his inclusion to women in India's independence struggle. He celebrated non-violent uh, violent protests as feminine principles, naturalizing the masculine brutality of British rule. But his sexual hang-ups caused him to carry uh, monst monstrously sex sexist views. His view of the female body was warped, as accounted by Tita Banerjee in her book, Sex and Power. He believed menstruation was a manifestation of the distortion of a woman's soul by her sexuality. Please comment. <clears throat> Thanks so much. And there is so much written on Gandhi, and there are so many proponents and so many critics. And uh, definitely one thing I want to say is that Gandhi's views about women and the feminine and spirituality, they changed over time. And I have not had a chance to read Rita Banerjee, and I want to. Uh, because, but I, I do know that sometimes if you pull something from the very beginning and it's changed over time, uh, it's important to get the whole picture. And I just want to quickly mention the work of 
uh, Vinay Lal, who's a scholar on Gandhi who teaches at UCLA, and he's done a lot of work on this idea of the ways in which nonviolence was a fem feminine principle, and perhaps that's why some of the men, including uh, the people who uh, plotted to kill Gandhi, didn't like nonviolence because they wanted a masculine India, not a feminine India. So uh, Gandhi is often considered the proponent of the feminine. And uh, near the end of uh, his life, one of his nieces writes, Bapu, my mother, she considered him a maternal uh, energy. But I know that these, these issues are very controversial and many scholars have written a lot. So I don't want to say that everything Gandhi said was perfectly right or healthy. Um, uh, but some of it may have been misunderstood. And some of what Gandhi held, uh, held to was uh, um, the importance of women and the respect he had to women. And so, and Gandhi may be having some contradictions there, but we have to look at the whole picture. Can we take up some more questions? Yeah, go ahead. We have more question from Priyanka Singh. She says, Mohandas Gandhi held India back when it came to women's rights and his own behavior around them should be bizarre. Okay, well, good point. So there's one, one uh, you can look at his behavior, but then you can look at the political record. And I tried to show here that actually Gandhi is indebted to women for some of his insights. Because I think that oftentimes there's the great man theory of history, or there's the idea all of his influences, Tolstoy, Tagore, and others definitely influences. But what about the women influences? We need to know uh, more about those. And here you can at least see, although it was belated, he did involve women in his movement. But in 1930, at the Salt March, he did not have any women salt marchers, even though many of them really wanted to be counted among the 80 salt marchers. Now, uh, there are still great strides uh, uh, made uh, for women and for India due to Gandhi's influence. But why did he not? Uh, take the lessons he learned from 1913 and involve women more directly. But it will be important to note that at the end of the Salt March, we have the leadership of Sarojini Naidu. And she's important also because she came to South Africa and she spent time in South Africa giving speeches in the 1920s after Gandhi had left. And she struck up a close friendship with Sissi Gould who would become another important women activist in South Africa. So Sarojini Naidu, having this great experience in South Africa in the 1920s, comes back in 1930 and is able to lead this uh, Satyagraha at the Darasana Salt Works. Despite the fact that during the whole march, uh, there weren't any official, there were many women who accompanied, but none of them were the official marchers that he had named. Thank you, madam. One more question uh, from same person, I think, uh, Priyanka Singh. Madam, Gandhi believed Indian women who were raped lost their value as human beings. He argued that fathers could be justified in killing daughters who had been sexually assaulted for the sake of family and community honor. He moderated his views towards the end of his life. Are you agree with this type of thought, ma'am? Please clarify. 
Well, thank goodness you mentioned he moderated his views later because that's important. And that's part of why, I, not that I'm never critical of Gandhi, but that's part of why I can still advocate the relevance of Gandhi's message today. He advocated many of the views, I mean, he changed many of the views that his critics uh, uh, mentioned before. So no, I do not agree with the early version that says a father should should uh, kill his daughter for rape. Now, it is important to understand that Gandhi was really focused on this idea of honor, not that it should express itself in that way. But this was part, his mentioning his emphasis on honor in the 1913 Satyagraha in relation to recognizing Indian marriages was uh, equating the honor of Indian women with the national honor of India. And honor was a very important uh, value for Gandhi along with bravery. But I would modify that and say this honor has to show itself nonviolently and should never express itself like Gandhi mentioned in that earlier quote, express itself through any honor killing. I would not agree with that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. One more question uh, from Asish Jakar. Mahatma Gandhi was the leader of India's nonviolent independence movement against British rule and in South Africa, who advocated for the civil rights of Indians. May I repeat, ma'am? It's, it's a question. Who, I'm sorry. The last part was, in, in, I'm looking for it in the Maybe chat. Maybe you can just uh, <laughs> yeah, comment it, on that. It's yeah, question, it, yeah. Just comment on that. Yeah. Um, Mahatma Gandhi was the leader of, let me repeat, Mahatma Gandhi was the leader of India's nonviolent independence movement against British rule and in South Africa, who advocated for the civil rights of Indians. This is his comments. Do you have anything to highlight on this? That's uh, about his, his role with the civil rights and the human, and human rights. Uh, I'm yeah, you sorry. Do have some five minutes, so you can continue, yeah. perhaps. You can just yeah. uh, add whatever you have to say. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, definitely, Gandhi had a, a very big role. He he never did things by himself, of course. Any of the things that uh, that happened in history were both a joint effort of Gandhi and others who helped him, as well as a product of sometimes unforeseen uh, circumstances larger than himself. And he was somebody who was very keen to understand other persons and their goals and aspirations and how to either have them uh, devote themselves to his project or in what way to be able to oppose them nonviolently. These were the great skills he had, and that's part of how he has this stature today. Okay, there are many comments, I think, but uh, there, is, there is no more question. So uh, thank you, uh, Madam Gail Presby for your illustrious speech and of course, the interaction part, whatever you have clarified, I think audience is being highly satisfied and encouraged on your uh, interaction part. Okay. So thank now, you so much. I really yeah. appreciated this opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.